Dominique Levin is a senior research fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge University, and a fellow of the British Academy. Uh, I mentioned that uh, yesterday, and I remind for those of you who was there again that for for um, you know, Professor Levin, this is this is a sort of a ho homecoming. In 73-74, he was Kennedy Scholar here at Harvard. Uh, and uh, mm, he's a recipient of numerous awards, uh, Pushkin House Prize, the Order of Friendship from Russian Federation, um, uh, and uh, mm, French Award as well for the um, uh, book Russia Against Napoleon. And uh, Professor Levin's uh, last book towards uh, the flame, empire, war, and the end of Tsarist Russia, um, again, is, is uh, praised and, and acclaimed, and uh, there is, uh, I have an excerpt from the Financial Times review of the <laughs> book uh, that uh, says Levin's interpretation is the result of his own heroic research <laughs> endeavors mm -hmm. in newly available Russian Foreign Ministry archives. And the quote goes on and on and <coughs> on, but I'll stop here <laughs> stressing heroic <laughs> in, in all of that. And it's really my great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Levin again now for, for mm -hmm. second for second presentation for today. Second. And we'll be talking mm -hmm. about 1914, Russia, World War um, one and uh, the the topic apparently on which everyone was sad, <laughs> but maybe not 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 everything was was uh, uh, really covered, and we we'll, we we'll certainly look forward to 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 your presentation. Thank you, Sergey. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for turning up on a cold and rainy day. I mean, in a sense, uh, the title and the subject of the talk is um, ad hominem. Uh, the first book I wrote was uh, Russia and the Origins of the First World War. It was published in 83. It wasn't actually the topic of my thesis. That turned into my second book. Uh, but I suppose you could say what I'm doing is asking myself uh, why I went back to this theme decades later and whether it was worthwhile. So it's a sort of apologia pro vita sua. Um, I think there were four substantial reasons for going back. The first and pettiest, but not entirely unimportant, was that with the centenary of the war, in other words 2014, an avalanche of books were launched only one of which was really from the Russian angle, which was Sean McMeekin's book. Um, it was, frankly speaking, not a very good book. It restated essentially the thesis of Petrovsky, right back in the early Soviet era, who argued that more than any other power, Russia was responsible for bringing about the war because of its ambitions at the Straits and Constantinople. And although I don't think McMeekin's book really was worth a very ferocious counterattack. Um, the fact that it was taken up by probably the two books <coughs> in the English and French languages which had the greatest impact, in other words, Chris Clark's Sleepwalkers and Georges Henri Soutou, um, does, I think, make it worth uh, combating McMeekin's interpretation, even if actually one was just going to state a number of basic points which you could have got from the existing evidence, uh, existing even when I wrote my book back in 83. So that's one reason. The second, of course, is simply the enduring importance of 1914. This is year zero for Russia. Um, a huge amount of Russian 20th century history can, to some extent, be traced back to 14. Without 14, things might have been very different. There is, in addition, the fact that um, there is an eerie... Uh, resonance uh, in contemporary international relations. Uh, I wrote research, wrote this, well, wrote it particularly, um, sitting in East Asia, where, as I say, I live half the year, um, and there are very unpleasant uh, parallels between what's building up to be a ginormous crisis in East Asia and what happened in Europe before the First World War. The third reason, and I think we're getting on to the two which mattered most for me, is that, lo and behold, you know, 1983 was some inconceivable amount of time ago, and I have had the odd new thought since. 
Um, to some extent, uh, this is above all to do with the international context, international comparisons, though to some extent Russian history as well. Uh, I've had a strange career in the sense that for the overwhelming majority of it, I was in a politics department, though always a historian. Uh, and on top of that, uh, because for some 15 years in the middle of my career, I was responsible for our children with my wife at the other end of the world, uh, I sort of went comparative. This was not a great moment for diving off into Russian archives. So, you know, in my youth, I worked in Russian archives and produced two books. In my middle age, I wrote three comparative books, essentially. And in my old age, I wrote two books back in the Russian archives. And in a sense, this last book, On the Origins of the First World War, does benefit partly from work I did on comparative politics. Uh, systems of guardianship. You know, to some extent, you get that with Kemalism in Turkey and uh, the regime in Iran. Uh, but you also, of course, if you extrapolate backwards, get it into the pre in the pre-1914 monarchies where the whole principle is that you are allowing society greater room to breathe, greater room to express itself, to have a say in legislation, uh, in reflection of the fact that society is more mature, more literate, but at the same time the ultimate guardianship, sovereignty, remains with the monarch. So it's quite interesting making those comparisons. I also, with two buddies, one a historian of Spain and one a historian of the Balkans, taught a rather interesting course called the Second Europe, which was essentially a study of the European periphery, West, South and East, in the era of modern mass politics. In other words, from the 1850s down to 1945. And out of that have come a number of ideas, which I think you'll find reflected in the book if you read it a little bit in this talk. Above all, of course, I was interested in empire. I wrote a book about empire, uh, was involved in all sorts of ways in studying empire, and that too uh, feeds very much into my interpretation of the origins of the war. But certainly the most important reason for going back was that when I worked on this book in the early 80s, the Russian diplomatic and military archives were closed to foreigners. Um, I snuck in for a year, essentially, for this book, finished my research a week actually before the Foreign Ministry Archive closed. It's reopened just this autumn. Uh, and there is a vast amount there. So those were the four <coughs> basic reasons uh, for going back to the theme. I think in ascending order of importance, at least in my view. All right, what about the book itself? Well, I suppose about five, perhaps a bit more than five percent of it is what you might describe as an international history of the Russian Revolution, particularly of its origins. And I suppose the key to this is the whole idea of foreign intervention, how crucial foreign intervention was, and the absence of foreign intervention was as well. I'll explain what I mean in a second. In other words, the international context. Very much neglected on the whole by historians of the revolution of my generation, where much more of interest was the ideological struggle, of course, between Western and Soviet Bolshevik camps. Um, and the basic point I was making was simple. The monarchy very nearly collapsed in the winter of 1905 to 6. If it had, I think the revolution would certainly have spiralled to the left. Uh, that is in the nature of revolutions, and there were plenty of reasons why it would happen in Russia. But I think you would have had, at that point, massive and effective European intervention. I think you're living in cloud cuckoo land if you imagine that the European great powers are going to sit by while Russia secedes from the international system, sets itself up as the center of international <coughs> socialist revolution and confisc confiscates the modern equivalent of trillions of dollars of foreign debt. The key to foreign intervention was always going to be Germany. Germany, the neighbor, Germany with the formid most formidable army in Europe. And the Germans would have had a fourth overwhelming reason to intervene, which was the fate of the German community in Russia, and particularly the Baltic German community, which had excellent links in Berlin. The Kaiser promised the leader of the Baltic Germans that if the monarchy fell, the German army would intervene in the Baltic provinces. And, you know, when you look at the, the archives, uh, the Russian archives are packed with intercepts, and indeed you find this in foreign archival sources as well, of pleas and howls by foreign embassies and consulates uh, for intervention. Uh, the British consul 
in, in Riga is howling for the intervention of the Royal Navy, even before things have gone fully to, to extremes. What the result of intervention would have been, God knows. But it, again, might have produced very different outcomes to what we had. I'm sure it would have succeeded in the short run, short to medium. The longer-term consequence is a different matter. Then compare this to what happened in 17 Germany, which would have been the key to international counter-revolution in peacetime, does everything it can to speed the revolution on and to radicalise it for obvious and perfectly legitimate reasons in wartime. What the Germans do, apart from getting Lenin back to Russia and his sealed train, is essentially to give the Bolsheviks a year of breathing space. Uh, it's only after the defeat of Germany and the end of the First World War that any version of effective foreign intervention begins. And even then, Franco-British intervention is pathetic by the standards of what it would have been, you know, peacetime German intervention over the Western border. So, you know, interesting interesting and not to be forgotten in any kind of general study of the revolution. About 30% of the book is precisely international contexts and comparisons. And I've already more or less spelt out what I mean by that. I won't go into detail about this, partly because for me the most important element here is empire, and I spoke about that yesterday. Um, just to put it very briefly, although I am not a man for monocausal explanations, it seems to me that the single most important factor in Europe's slide into war is the question of empire, uh, by which I do not mean just shrewdly the nationalist challenge to empire, the old paradigm of fading empire and vibrant nationalism. It's much more complicated than that. And the crisis is partly rooted in the fact that empire is very vibrant as well. Indeed, it appears to be, and to some extent is, the key to international power. And in that sense, is in absolute crass contradiction to the fact that nationalism appears to be the driving force in domestic politics, both to consolidate communities and legitimise governments. And it is not just minority nationalism, which very much complicates the business of empire, but also majority nationalism, which in a sense is trying to turn the empire into a vehicle for the culture and the interests of a single national community, admittedly the biggest one, which undermines many of the balances and compromises on which traditional empire rests. Uh, as I say, you, I won't say more about it now, you're welcome to ask. And as for this question of second Europe, um, there are all sorts of interesting elements here. Um, but I think it is terribly interesting to compare around the periphery, partly because it isn't done, in part simply because people don't have the linguistic abilities. But if you look at Spain or Italy, for instance, and you look at the resentment of so much of the Spanish and Italian intelligentsia, at the fact that somehow they're always inferior to the core countries of Europe from which they take their models and against which they judge themselves. The resentments, something of the political instability as well, um, partly, partly linked to the weakness of the state. Look at the Italian state's attempt to turn whoever you call it, Sicilians, Neapolitans, the lot, into Italians, and its failure. Um, the failure with the peasantry, the failure with the south. Looking at the reasons for that failure and comparing them to the Russian situation certainly opens uh, a window onto the problems of the Russian government in using its educational system to try and inculcate a sense of Russian identity uh, into both peasants and Slav non-Russians. It's quite interesting also here to link up with empire. Um, if you look at the way in which both the Spanish and the Italian regimes attempt to use imperialism for principles of domestic legitimation, uh, and stability, and the way it goes horribly wrong. You know, the, the debacle in Morocco brings down the Spanish liberal monarchy. The debacle in uh, Ethiopia comes close to doing the same to the Italian liberal monarchy. The liberal monarchy does fall, essentially, after the First World War, again, out of an international crisis. Comparisons with the Russo-Japanese War and the various dynamics of Second World peripheral Europe imperialism are fun. And I think quite interesting. Again, ask about all of this, um, particularly, as I say, about empire. But the main bit of the book, 60-65%, is essentially about Russian foreign and military policy, Russian diplomacy, but also the links 
between diplomacy, foreign policy, and the domestic political system, and to deeper issues of Russian identity and Russia's place in history. So I'll now concentrate just for a bit in summing up what seemed to me my conclusions on that main element of the book. I mean, it seems to me that Russian policy was essentially driven by three factors. One is security, which above all means fear of German hegemony in Europe, fear of German power, and the appeal to a European balance of power strategy to check that. It is driven by interests, or as some people would say ambitions, and that above all means Russian interests at the Straits, Russian determination to control its main export uh, channel, uh, and also to some extent linked to that Russian ambitions in the Balkans. And then thirdly, you have Russian policy driven by identity which first and foremost means the sense of that Russian elite, and it is the elite and exclusively the elite which drives foreign policy, the sense that to be, to be the Russia to which they feel they belong, with which they identify, in which they take pride, you have to be a great power, a great empire. I think I said this yesterday evening, as Volsky says it to uh, Stalipin, Sazonov writes it in his memoirs, you know. Um, if we cease to be the Russia of Peter and Catherine, if we cease to be a great power, if we cease to be one of the leading peoples in the world, we cease to be Russians as we understand what it means to be a Russian. So all of these factors are important. And I think I would simply make two concluding points about this. The first is that obviously these three factors overlap. Uh, if you look at the Balkans, uh, quite clearly the desire to be the leader of the Balkan Slav and Orthodox camp is part of a conception of Russia's Slav identity, Russia's Orthodox identity, you name it. But it is equally, obviously, to do with Russian interests or Russian ambitions. Uh, obviously, if you control the Balkans through your alliances, you control the hinterlands of the Straits, which gives you much greater leverage as and when the issue of Constantinople and the Straits comes over the horizon. But it is also absolutely, the Balkans policy, part of a general policy of balance of power and security. You know, you reckon on the fact that how many hundreds of thousands, even of Serbs, after 1912, let alone Balkan League troops, would be your allies on the southern front? How many Austrian army corps does that mean will not be fighting you in the east? So these three, three elements are merged, and it is precisely because they are merged, specifically in this policy in southeastern Europe, that the policy is so strong, uh, so easily defended, so relatively invulnerable to criticism. I mean, the other equally obvious but sometimes forgotten point is that these three factors are hardly unique to Russia. If you look at fears of German hegemony and the attempt to create uh, a counterweight to German security, uh, German potential hegemony through the balance of power, well, after all, that is the thinking in Paris and London as well. There's not essentially much difference. If you are looking at Russian interests, ambitions, the straits, and Sean McMeekin, of course, goes overboard about Ron Babrov and much more sensibly also, also stresses this, they are, to an extent, right. Russian ambitions at the straits uh, you know, are a source of fear among other European great powers, insecurity, you name it. But it hardly makes sense pointing a finger at Russia uh, and forgetting the fact that this, after all, is the age of high imperialism in which the British have pinched, for example, the Suez Canal and taken over the whole of Egypt and Sudan, uh, in principle, in order to defend their, their position at the Suez. And the Americans have pinched Camp in Panama and staged their own version of a sort of revolution in Colombia to do it. On balance, the Straits matter a great deal more to Russia even than Suez does to the British or Panama does to the Americans because Russia has no other outlet for its main exports. On those exports depend its entire balance of trade, balance of payments, its whole strategy of economic modernization. Those exports are extremely bulky and they cannot go out of southern Russia and Ukraine except through the Straits. And then finally, identity again. It is entirely fair to point to you know, Russia's attempt to be and to portray itself as the leader of the Slav cause uh, as a certain source of insecurity. It stirs up all sorts of fears of so-called pan-Slavism in Berlin and even more in Vienna, etc., etc., etc. 
But again, you have to place this in the context of a world in which increasingly by the late 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, the great powers are, if you like, dividing up, at least in embryo, uh, into what you might describe as geopolitical ethno-ideological blocks. Uh, that's rather a mouthful. What I mean is that you have Anglo-American reconciliation. Remember that for much of the 19th century, the British and the Americans have been both geopolitical and ideological rivals. Uh, by the late 19th century, you have a very strong trend towards reconciliation, cultural unity. This is when you get Mahan from the Americas. This is when you get the intermarriages. This is when you get the British government absolutely and deliberately appeasing the Americans over issues like Venezuela, Panama, you name it, precisely because they are firstly going with the current of elite British opinion, and they are also aware of the absolute need uh, to cut out all possibility of conflict with the United States, given the growing challenges to the British Empire elsewhere. And you have the same principle in Central Europe, the old Habsburg Hohenzollern, or even older Catholic-Protestant rivalry in Germany, uh, pushed aside by German, reun German unification in 71 and the Austro-German alliance of 79. You know, essentially, Russia smashes itself to bits in the 20th century um, by attempting first, well, by conflicting, firstly, with the Germanic bloc and then the Anglo-American one in the Cold War. Uh, and the problem before 1914 is not that the Russians, with their ideas of Slav solidarity, are any more wicked than ideas in Ber Berlin and Vienna or <coughs> London and... Uh, Washington about Anglo-American or Germanic solidarity. It's just that Russia is weaker. In the first place, there is no Slav solidarity. The two major Slav peoples are at each other's throats, the Russians and the Poles. There's not even any orthodox Slav solidarity in the Balkans. The Serbs and the Bulgarians are at each other's throats. And even if the Slav world was united, it would still be much weaker than the Germanic bloc, which, after all, incorporates the most dynamic elements in the European economy let alone than the vast potential power of the British Empire and the United States combined. So again, it is important to see things in a context, in comparison. Because frankly speaking, if you don't do that, I mean, McMeekin is an extreme case, but any single country study of the First World War's origin, which does not have a sense of international contrast and comparisons, very easily just falls into the finger-pointing or exculpatory line, you know. So, okay, so, you know, that is, I think, a short summary of the main conclusions of the book as regards Russian foreign policy. What about new sources, new evidence? What do they provide which was not there in, in 1983? Well, I mean, fundamentally, as I say, the, the key new sources are access to the vitally important foreign ministry and war ministry. Uh, archives. But there's more than that. Um, for example, even when I wrote the book in 83, I was aware of the fact that the Russian number two in Belgrade, Strandman, who becomes, of course, the charge uh, just before the July crisis, when the minister Hartwig has a heart attack and dies, his memoirs were under the bed of his daughter, who was 102 years old in Washington, living with the daughter of the American minister in Belgrade, convinced that anyone who wanted to look at her dad's memoirs was a KGB agent. Well, now they're not under her bed. She's safely in heaven, poor love. Uh, they're in the Bakhmetiev archive in Colombia. So uh, reading all of that. Then there are, for example, the, the memoirs which were published in the mid-'80s, mid after I'd written the book, of Grigory Trubetskoy, who I'll talk about in a minute, who was the head of the Near Eastern Department of the Foreign Ministry. And they are very, very important. And they're all the family, his unpublished, still unpublished, first volume of his memoirs, lots of correspondence, which the family, the Trubetskoys, still have and were kind enough to give me. So, you know, there are a whole range of things um, which weren't available then and which are now. Now, one snotty character said to me, well, fine, but, you know, you've got all this new stuff. You haven't come up with a fundamentally different conclusion. What he meant by that was that, you know, I hadn't come up with a different answer to that perennial question, who done it, the detective story, July 1914, you were responsible, you, you, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, in the end, the new evidence rather balances itself off. Some of it makes Russia look worse, some of it makes Russia look better. Um, 
<coughs> I think my general conclusion, if what interests you is the, the name-calling blame, who was to, the name-calling game, who was to blame, my conclusion would be that Russia did share part of the blame for the catastrophe, but not more than the British and the French, and much less than the Austrians and the Germans. But there is actually much more of interest in the international crisis which led to the First World War than simply sitting in July 1914 and saying, eh, meh, meh, was the Germans, or meh, 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 was the English. You know, there is a whole subtle range of factors uh, involved in all of this, um, which quite apart from being extremely important in themselves are horrifyingly familiar to anyone who, you know, is looking at contemporary goings-on, particularly in East Asia. I can't even begin course, to summarise all these, these documents. So I'll just pick out one or two areas. I mean, one of the things that I was able to do was to read all the diplomatic correspondence between Belgrade and Petersburg in the archives from 1908 to 1914. The Serbian-Russian relationship is crucial. And all the remaining correspondence between the military attaché in Belgrade and the war ministry in Petersburg. One or two of his reports, including very detailed reports on the Black Hand, the organization which kills Franz Ferdinand went all the way up to Nicholas II. Uh, it's very interesting to look at that. Uh, and then there's a great deal of private correspondence, um, mostly in the archives in Moscow and Petersburg, sometimes elsewhere. And then, of course, as I say, there's all the material from Trubetskoy, there's the Strandman diaries. Well, um, I think all that correspondence... Well, for a start, I mean, quite literally, some of it makes, made my hair stand on end. I mean, you know, if you want an example both of the difficulties of a great power controlling minor powers, clients, and of exactly the wrong way to go about trying to control your clients, just look at the Russian-Serb relationship. Um, you know, the, Peter, the Petersburg government cannot even control its own minister in Belgrade, who is telling things to the Serbs which he is not telling his own government. The mission in Belgrade itself is split because the minister uh, is backing Pasic and the civilians in Serbia. The military attaché is backing the Serbian army, who are at loggerheads. The number two, Strunkman, thinks Hartwig is a traitor uh, for his, the way he's actually criticising Sazonov, the foreign minister, behind his back. It goes on and on. Uh, you know, Russia is to some extent putting itself on the line to defend Serbia and is to some extent even exciting Serbian ambitions. Uh, meanwhile, it is relying on its minister to control Pasic, the prime minister, which he can't do. Pasic can't control the, the military. Pasic can't even control Spalajkovic, his main ally in the foreign ministry. There is a horrifying moment in, in Oct September, October 1913, when actually Hartwig is on leave. Uh, and so is Pasic, the Prime Minister, when you find Spalajkovic in charge of Serbian foreign, minister, uh, foreign policy, essentially attempting to incite a new insurrection in Albania at dire risk to European war, at exactly the same time that the Chief of the Serbian General Staff is telling the Russian military attaché Atamonov that in all circumstances Serbia must avoid a war in the next four to five years. Total lack of coordination. Uh, on the other hand, and, and so on the whole, looking at all this correspondence is a black mark against Russia. Things are even worse than I thought. On the other hand, it is perfectly clear that Atamonov, the military attaché, had nothing whatsoever to do with the assassination at Sarajevo. To take another great block of evidence, which actually, if anything, makes the Russians look better. You have to remember that the published correspondence, or almost all the published correspondence on Russian foreign policy to some extent, Russian security policy, the great series, Mirnarodne at Nashenia, ends in the beginning of September 1912 when the First Balkan War begins and resumes on the 1st of January 1914. There is an enormous great gap and a very crucial one since what happened in the two Balkan Wars and the Lehman von Sanders crisis is absolutely fundamental to Russia's position in July 14. So, of course, it was very interesting indeed to be able to read all that correspondence, both in the foreign ministry and the military archives, and to some extent the, the records of the Council of Ministers. In the past, Western scholars in particular, or Anglophone ones in particular, have been far too dependent in the absence of the archival documents on the memoirs of Vladimir Kokovtsev, who was the, the chairman of the Council of Ministers at the time. 
who, of course, uh, is that partly they're dependent on Kokosov because he is almost the unique source on the subject, and partly his memoirs are translated into English, and they're very extravagant, if you like, or he paints a picture in which, um, you know, he is the hero, and his arch enemy is the war minister, etc., etc., are the villains. Um, when you actually look at all the material in the archives, firstly, it is actually blindingly clear that Kakovtsov's uh, narrative is factually incorrect in very important ways. I mean, Churchill calls this terminological inexactitude. When you want to, you know, uh, perhaps Kakovtsov has got things mixed up. He does write his memoirs many years later <coughs> without his notes in exile. What comes across from the archives is a much more nuanced picture and one which makes it much easier to ask and understand the position of the Russian military authorities, whom Kakovtsov, of course, completely damns. It is also to the point that in the Council of Ministers, all the civilian ministers back the military, except for Sazonov and, uh, and Kakovtsov. Fundamentally, the, the military leadership is paranoid because they believe, and correctly believe, that if they and Austria mobilise with equal efficiency from the same <coughs> starting date, the Austrians will have a minimum of 10 days advantage over them uh, on the Eastern Front. The main Russian railheads <coughs> are within 35 miles of the Austrian frontier. It is w if the two sides mobilise with equal speed and efficiency, it is well within the capacity, therefore, of the Austrian army uh, to overrun the Russian railways, <coughs> at which point the Russians are going to have to deploy way to the rear because of the nature of the railway network. If the Russians deploy way to the rear, uh, then there is the danger of a Polish insurrection, and the archival documents are packed with um, information about Austrian plans for a Polish <coughs> insurrection. You have to remember that the Russians don't just have Redl and one other key spy in the Austrian military. Uh, Pilsudski, uh, his main agent negotiating with the Austrian general staff is an Ochrana spy. So actually the Russians know more about what is going on in Galicia than the Austrian central civilian authorities do. It's a strange setup. But above all else, if you're forced to deploy well to the rear in Poland, the whole left flank of the Russian advance into East Prussia um, is, is open. And therefore the offensive into East Prussia is dead before it's begun. So the generals had a point, you know. They're not as stupid, nor are they as extravagant as Kakovtsev is claiming. And um, understanding Russian military thinking in the winter of 12, <coughs> spring of 13, is absolutely fundamental to understanding how they interpret the July crisis and why they act the way they do. If I was going to generalise, I would certainly say, that the most important documents I looked at were in the Foreign Ministry Archive, which is, after all, what you'd expect. But the single most in important document is probably in the Military Archive, although it is actually really a civilian document. This is a speech made by the new Minister of Foreign Affairs, Alexander Zvolsky, to the State Defence Council in February 1907. The State Defence Council <coughs> is dominated by generals and, to a lesser extent, admirals. Izvolsky is speaking to a collection of generals who are paranoid about Russian military vulnerability in East Asia and Japanese ambitions there, quite correctly arguing that Russia is quite incapable of defending itself, defending Vladivostok, etc. He is also up against naval uh, well, admirals, and particularly Fedya Dubasov, who basically argues the, the, the line which justified Russian policy in the 1890s in East Asia. In other words, the future of the world economy and of the international balance of power lies in the Asia-Pacific <coughs> region. Russia's future lies in Siberia and the Maritime Province, because if we can develop that, we will be the only truly European great power in the 20th century which can compete with the United States, which will certainly be a superpower in the 20th century. And this is what Fedor Dubasov said um, in, the, in the State Defense Council. Izvolsky responds in the following very interesting ways. And in so doing, he speaks about the fundamentals of Russian foreign policy, which underlie that policy down to 14. He says, firstly, that you cannot divorce foreign policy from deeper issues of culture, identity, and geopolitical interest. 
The Russians, he says, are fundamentally a European and Christian power. On top of that, the centers of Russian wealth, population, military power, government, are in Europe. If, he says, you are going to prioritize East Asia, then the first thing you need to do is shift the capital from Petersburg to Chelyabinsk, or Omsk. In any event, he says, even if you wish to do that, uh, it will be at least two generations before Russia has any possibility of being a true Pacific great power to match the United States or Japan. He says, and this is also crucial, he adds, that in East Asia, despite the general's fears, actually it is possible to come to a compromise with the Japanese which will not endanger Russian essential interests. And, of course, Izvolsky speaks with a special authority because he is a former minister in Tokyo. He argues, rather interestingly, that actually the Russo-Japanese war was unnecessary. Compromises could have, achieved, could have been achieved with Japan before 1903, which would have secured Russian essential interests. They can be uh, made now, he says. The Japanese are not fundamentally interested in taking over Russia's possessions in East Asia. On the contrary, he says, not merely are Russian interests in the Near East and above all in East Central Europe much greater, but they are also much more in danger. And again, the reason he says this is very interesting. He says, we cannot control events in the Near East or in East Central Europe. Fundamentally, because of the impending crisis of the Ottoman and Austrian Empire. He says the Austrian and Turkish questions, as he put it, will come on the agenda in their full force in the next 20 years and may be resolved, which is nice diplomatic speak for saying, you know, those empires may go. And they may go, and we can't do anything about it, fundamentally for internal reasons and because of the ambitions of the other great powers which we can't control. We do not dare, he says, to stand aside from these issues without relegating ourselves to the status of Persia. And again, you get this question of identity. You know, Russia is a great power, or it isn't Russia. But even more to the point and down to earth, it's not much fun being Persia before 1914. Persia is essentially partitioned between the British and the, the Russians. You know, this is a world of high imperialism. Uh, there are very few nice, safe spots the world appears to be increasingly divided between the gobblers and the gobbled. Uh, and if you're Russia, a backward <coughs> country in Eurasia, you want to make damn sure you're among the gobblers, to put things again crudely. Uh, so it's interesting the way our, you know, Izvolsky is arguing, and it does very much speak to things beyond the absolute surface of diplomacy, to deeper questions about what are our most essential interests and who are we. And what is our place in history? As I say, there's not a fundamental change between Izvolsky and Sazonov, which is not at all surprising because Sazonov is put in by Benkendorf, the ambassador in London, Izvolsky, who's now in Paris, as a safe bet, someone who will follow their policy. He had served under both of them. He was junior to them. He was less intelligent than them. And he was also Stalipin's brother in what Sazonov does add is a Slavophil element. Izvolsky was completely immune to any Slavophil sympathies. If you want to understand the underlying factors in Sazonov's policy, the best thing to do is to look at Prince Grigory Nikolaevich Trubetskoy for all sorts of reasons, three in particular. Firstly, Trubetskoy's position. He was, from 1912, the de facto head of the Near Eastern Department of the Foreign Ministry, the crucial department covering Balkan and Ottoman affairs. He was also a more intelligent than, man than Sazonov and a man who thought in more systematic ways. This is the younger brother of the former rector of Moscow University and of Yevgeny, the uh, idealist philosopher. This is a man with a, you know, a much stronger conceptual mind than Sazonov. And Trubetskoy himself writes in his memoirs that he was often scared by just how much weight Sazonov ascribed to his opinions. The second very important reason for studying Trubetskoy is that although he is a professional diplomat, he retires from the foreign ministry between 1906 and 1912 and helps his elder brother Yevgeny 
um, to edit Moskovsky Yezhnedelnik. On the pages of Moskovsky Yezhnedelnik, Trubetskoy essentially creates, along with his buddy Pyotr Struba, the foundations, the basic doctrinal base for what you might describe as liberal imperialism in Russia. And he doesn't just create the ideas which underpin this conception of liberal imperialism. He goes a long way, along with Struva and some of his other allies, to creating the political support for it. Through his connections with Moscow business, through Ryabushinsky's in particular, through his connections with the press and with the Duma majority parties. And it immediately is striking that here you have someone who is a semi-oppositionist in 1906 to 12, uh, and is absolutely a key figure in Russian public opinion, who then becomes head of the key department in the Russian foreign ministry. That tells you something immediately about the links between state and society. And then there is a third important reason for being very interested in Grigory Trubetskoy, in the sense that all these... Uh, articles he writes in Moskovsky and Nedelnik, together with articles in other press organs and a major book to which he contributes, are more than just comments on contemporary affairs. It is almost as if you have a professor of international relations writing avant la lettre. So in other words, he's not just talking about German-Russian relations or this or that, or Balkan affairs. He's talking about principles of international security, uh, theories of deterrence and of the balance of power, the link between identity and foreign policy. You've even got elements of democratic peace theory there. He is, in other words, talking in a way which is actually unique among the 20 or 30 key decision makers in Europe in 1914. Uh, you won't find anyone else in Europe whom you can actually document talking in these terms. The closest you'll get is Rietzler, Bettmann Holweg, sort of guru. Uh, but there's much more. We have much more of uh, Trubetskoy than, than Rietzler. And essentially what comes out of Trubetskoy is precisely what I was talking about. It is conceptions of security rooted in the balance of power. It is conceptions of threat rooted in ideas that democracy is peaceful and the Kaiserreich is authoritarian, partly for domestic political reasons, and is I mean, not author expansionist, partly for domestic political reasons. And there are very powerful ideas about Russia's identity linked to its role as an orthodox and Slav <coughs> power. And you have to remember that Grigory Trubetskoy is an out-and-out -out Muscovite, uh, he is an out-and-out -out Slavophile, very orthodox. Uh, he is very, his mother's family, uh, the Lapukhins, are linked to all the major gentry uh, Slavophile families. Samarin is his, grand, uh, his godfather. So you have an absolutely clear and fascinating link of biography, social and cultural history to foreign policy there. In the book, I juxtaposed to Grigory Trubetskoy someone called Baron Roman Rosen, von Rosen, from the Baltic German gentry. But Rosen has a Russian Orthodox mother and a Russian Orthodox wife. So he's not any kind of pure Baltic German. And of course, he spent his whole career in the Russian Foreign Ministry. He succeeded Izvolsky, actually, as minister in Tokyo, a very good uh, and you know, intelligent minister in Tokyo. And his last job was as ambassador in Washington from which he retires in 1911. Rosen's views on foreign policy are precisely the opposite, really, of Trubetskoy's, and again can be very interestingly rooted in broader issues or broader conceptions of Russian identity, place in history, etc. Fundamentally, he argues that the time is over when we should think in European terms. We need to think globally. And in terms of the global balance of power, the biggest threat to us is the Anglo-Americans, not the Germans. And if Germany goes off on a campaign to contest domination of the North Sea and the North Atlantic with the British and French, glory. You know, there are elements of Stalin's policy in 1939 behind all this as well. Uh, he also argues that Russia's future lies in Asia, like Fyodor Dubasov, and the Asia-Pacific region. This links on to what I was talking about yesterday about empire. The basic argument being that 
to really count to be a truly great power in the 20th century, you need imperial continental scale. Only Russia, uh, if it preserves its present empire and develops it in Asia, has the potential to be a truly great power and compete with the United States. Uh, and this is all linked up to ideas about railways, colonization. Remember Mendeleev's prediction that there will be 600 million subjects of the Tsar by the mid 20th century. You know. uh, and then, fine, uh, and then uh, Rosen also says, this is the longer term perspective to which we must look we must ignore all this nonsense about Slav identity in the Balkans. Uh, the Balkan Slavs look after their own interests. They exploit us. The Balkans are of very little interest to us, really. Uh, Siberia is far more important, and in any event, if we get ourselves linked you know, to the Balkan Slavs and in confrontation with Austria and therefore Germany, World War, a, a major European war will bring about social revolution in Russia. Uh, and on top of that, as a coder, he says all this nonsense about Constantinople is just that and the Straits, even if we had it. Uh, remember, the Straits leads into a closed sea in the Mediterranean, both of whose exits are in British hands. We will in no sense be in a better position to secure our export trade. What is interesting is that just as Trubetskoy has what you might describe as more intellectual brothers, so does Roman Rosen. He is the brother of Victor Rosen the head of, a, of the dean of the faculty of essentially orientology at Petersburg University, the mentor of most or some of the leading Russian thinkers on Asia, on language. Ma, for instance, you know, Stalin's Ma is one of his uh, sort of students. Uh, and, and what Victor Rosen is providing is a sort of philosophical, historical, ideational, uh, that foundation for his brother's views on foreign policy. Uh, Victor and his crew, for instance, are arguing that if you look back at the origins of civilization, there is no clear division between Europe and Asia. They are arguing that culture is not rooted in ethnicity, let alone in race. In other words, they're arguing against many of the key underlying assumptions of European imperialism. And they are arguing for, in practical terms, uh, the evolution of a Russian imperial identity, which will be Eurasian, uh, which will glory in a culture which is more than Russian, though expressed in the Russian language, but which will accept different I ethnic identities as well. This isn't full-scale Eurasianism, and it isn't Soviet nationalities policy, but it is a significant step towards both. And it is all the more interesting, as I say, in, that you ha in being able to show the way in which concrete ideas about foreign policy are rooted in much deeper conceptions about Russian identity, Russia's place in history, and indeed the future of the human race. Okay, the last um, point I'll come on to is, or, yeah, the last major point, is preparing for war perceptions of a future war. And here there are really, well, there are lots of sources, but the two main ones, one of which I mentioned yesterday. I, in 1908, Nicholas II and Stalipin set up a sort of virtual special committee um, to prepare for a future European war, a great war. And all the civilian ministers were instructed to prepare plans, well, firstly, appreciations of what the impact of a future European war would be on the area of Russian life for which their ministry was responsible. Secondly, plans to actually prepare for that eventuality and detail costings. And it is very, 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 very interesting what they came up with. And this is in the archives in Petersburg. This is Regia. The second element, uh, main element in looking at plans and perceptions, is the work of Bloch, Ivan Bloch. Some of you may know about this. This is a Russian-Jewish railway entrepreneur and financier who, among other things, wrote a very interesting and very famous multi-volume book about what a future war would entail, a great war, European war. And essentially, he argues the point later taken up by Norman Angel, who essentially puts Bloch's ideas into English, saying that in the present state of the international capitalist economy, uh, war is redundant. 
Nowadays, war will be a disaster for everyone. No modern industrial capitalist state will win from a war, from victory, anything approaching what it will lose through the destruction of the international capitalist economy. And he argues that a war cannot last more than about three or four months, simply because any kind of war between the European great powers, given the nature of the present-day capitalist economy, will result very quickly in economic and social collapse and therefore political disintegration. And you have to remember that A, Bloch is a Russian citizen, B, the Russian government takes up this idea. Bloch's book comes out just before the Hague Peace Conference, which Russia launches. Uh, the Russians subsidize a one-volume summary. And actually, you know, Sazonov's two of his key advisors, his head of chancery, uh, Marie Schilling, and the deputy head of chancery, Basile, were the junior Russian delegates to the first Hague Peace Conference. And in Schilling's private papers in the archives, there are summaries of Bloch's ideas drawn up by Basile. Uh, what is generally forgotten, certainly in all Western uh, mentions of Bloch, is that although Bloch argued that a European war would be fatal for all the great powers and would be brief, he said that Russia would last out much better than the others because it was more backward and therefore less dependent on international capitalist financial insurance, etc. links. If you look at Sazonov, the influence of Bloch is obvious. Um, in fact, he recognizes it. Sazonov even writes subsequently in his memoirs that he'd always been convinced that unless Germany won a war within six months, it was bound to lose for reasons, the collapse of the German economy. Actually, at a key ultra-secret meeting uh, of the Russian political and military leadership in the winter of 1314, Sazonov says that unless Germany wins within two months, it's bound to lose. Now, that might seem very silly in retrospect, and Sazonov, I think, was not any kind of uh, great statesman, etc., etc., but you do have to remember that the British did have plans to break the German economy in two months, very detailed plans, which they gave up in July 1914 for fear that they would undermine the city, but above all, they would infuriate the Americans. So Sazonov is not quite as silly as you might imagine. As to the generals, uh, and this is really very, very interesting, you can trace in the archives absolutely direct links between their perceptions of a future war drawn from Bloch and they're planning for war. Sukhumlinov writes to Kakovtsev and Stalipin in 1990, this is the new war minister, saying that in military terms, a war can go on for a long time. But for economic and therefore political reasons, the West European powers, by which he means Germany too, cannot sustain a war for more than a very short period. The great danger to Russia, therefore, he says, is rapid defeat by Germany. And the Russians had a very good perception of what the Germans were intending to do, you know, the Schlieffen plan and everything. So Sukhumlinov's argument is that we must prepare against the greatest threat, which is rapid defeat. Uh, and that is indeed what they do plan for, plan against. Very interesting, for instance, that, you know, part of this so-called virtual special <coughs> conference uh, and the papers... Uh, include a very detailed appreciation of the Minister of Finance, Schieper, of Russian munitions, armaments, you name it, imports and needs during the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, and a lot of very intelligent comments about how one needs to remember this. But of course, if you're only thinking of a six-month maximum war, then everything is different. Now, you know, the, the general view is that the military leaderships as a whole, and specifically the Russian ones, were pretty goofy in their perceptions and planning for war. It's not, I think, altogether fair or that simple. It's certainly not true that the military leaderships, at least the Russian one, which I know about, uh, were unaware of the devastating uh, potential of modern defensive firepower. They were obsessed by it. They knew very well that their infantry was going to have to cover a kilometre of killing ground before they reached enemy defences. They were acutely aware of the fact that these infantry were no longer going to be veteran professional soldiers, but conscripts recalled from the reserve 
often 10 years after finishing military service. And they were also very aware of the fact that given modern weapons, these men were going to have to attack in something approaching open order, rather than the old close order formations with a corporal behind every three man back, men's back. And they were utterly, totally obsessed by how you were to motivate conscripts to take the enormous casualties that this would entail and keep going. They said it could be done. They pointed to the Japanese, who'd done it in the Japanese-Russian War. They pointed to the fact that Japanese infantry formations had sometimes taken 70% casualties but kept going and overrun Russian defences. The key reason they hated uh, the intelligentsia, certainly the liberal and radical intelligentsia, was that they regarded these people as undermining the army's efforts and need uh, to create patri patriotically indoctrinated soldiers. But the military intellectuals and the generals argued three things, essentially. They argued that, firstly, you could uh, indoctrinate soldiers. Uh, the Japanese had done it. The Germans and the French appeared to be doing it. Uh, they were very worried that Russia didn't seem able to do this, but they said, in principle, it was possible. And, of course, it was absolutely vital, because if your enemies did it and you didn't, you'd had it. The second thing they argued, that wars could only be won on the offensive. And the third thing they argued was that wars could still be won at a cost which made victory meaningful. And actually, when they pointed to history, they had it on their side. Obviously, in terms of the Franco-Prussian War, the German Wars of Unification, the Japanese-Russian War. Uh, overwhelmingly educated public opinion in Germany or in Japan considered that the sacrifice had been worthwhile. You have to remember, too, that the First Balkan War bore out everything the, ger the generals had predicted. Remember, the Balkan League <coughs> wins the war in a matter of weeks. It wins the war on the offensive by essentially preempting the Ottoman mobilization. Balkan Slav conscript armies, and Greek, well, Balkan Slav in particular, storm Turkish defensive positions, man by men, trained and armed by the Germans with the most modern firearms. Uh, and they win at a cost which virtually every Balkan intellectual outside the Marxist socialists think is worthwhile, and they win more decisively and more rapidly than anyone had imagined. They seem to confirm everything the generals had predicted. And beware again of this old hoary idea, especially strong in North America, that the generals should have paid attention to the American Civil War. Actually, the chief of the General Staff Academy, Nikolai Sukhortin, had written his thesis precisely on the American Civil War. He was a cavalry general. And for a time, the overwhelming majority of the Russian cavalry, for that reason in part, is turned over to a mounted infantry long-distance raiding role, a la Sherman, in the Civil War. Remember, too, and again, quite contrary to the general view, that the American Civil War did actually bear out precisely what the generals were saying. If you think of it, why in the end does the North win the Civil War? Well, first and foremost, because hundreds of thousands of American young men, Northern young men, are willing to def die in defense of American nationalism, a conception of the American Union that stretches from ocean to ocean, the identif identification of American nationalism with liberty, etc., etc. You know... The South was no threat to their homes, or indeed in any immediate sense to their own liberty. Uh, they had to invade, conquer, force back into the Union, the southern states. Secondly, of course, the war was won on the offensive. If the northern armies had stayed at home, the South would have won. Simple enough. And thirdly, although this war cost more American casualties than every other American war until you get deep into the Vietnam War put together, the overwhelming majority of modern Americans think that the casualties were worthwhile. And actually, so do the overwhelming majority of other people, certainly in Western Europe. Think of it. The American Civil War could very easily have ended with Southern independence and with the Northern Rump Union uh, at daggers drawn with the British. That is certainly what would have happened if Britain and France had intervened. Uh, in that case, Germany dominates Europe and we're, we're in, a in the 20th century and we're in a different world. So, you know, you are dealing with very fundamental consequences of the American Civil War. The whole geopolitical basis for the world in which we live is the alliance between a united North America and the British Empire. Uh, 
undermine that and we live in a different world. The contemporary crisis which we face now is precisely with something like 300 years of Anglo-American identity based on an enormous margin of power uh, is disappearing with every month that passes. Uh, and that has extremely exciting implications for you know, the next two generations. Of course, and this literally is the last thing I'll say, the generals got it wrong. The First World War did not uh, pan out as they had expected, but it very, very nearly did. Uh, as I said yesterday, the Germans, if they had not brought the Americans into the war at the moment that the Russian Revolution was about to take Russia, I would have won the First World War, uh, for better or worse. Uh, there is no way that the English and the French on the Western Front could have defeated Germany without Russia or America. Uh, and stalemate on the Western Front and Brest-Litovsk in the East means German victory and potential hegemony in Europe. I won't go into detail about this because I talked about it yesterday, but what fundamentally this reflects is the basic laws of European geopolitics, certainly from the fall of Napoleon to after the Second World War. The basic point is, to my mind, that Imperial Germany came closer to victory in Europe than either Napoleon or Hitler. And it did so because it actually surmounted the most fundamental challenge of European geopolitics. It is difficult, but possible, was difficult, but possible, uh, to conquer what you might describe as the Carolingian core of Europe, the founder countries of the European Union, France, Germany, the Netherlands, North, North Italy. Difficult, but possible. Didn't matter whether you did it from you know, a French base like Napoleon or a German base like Hitler. But the, then you face the great challenge of two huge centres of power on the periphery, one beyond the Channel in England and one beyond the Polish and Belarusian swamp and plain in Russia. Mobilising the resources on the basis of the Carolingian core to take on simultaneously the Russians and the, in the English was exceptionally difficult, and they would almost certainly gang up against you. However much they disliked each other, they would see you as a threat to their interests and their security. Difficult, but not impossible. The key to taking on Russia was not to do what Napoleon did and not to do what Hitler did. In other words, try to mount a purely military blitzkrieg strategy that is always going to run up against problems in Russia, given distance, given resources, etc., the far more intelligent strategy is a joint military-political one. And it was into that strategy that the Germans, to some extent, blundered in the First World War, to some extent planned, but more blundered. The irony, of course, is that that strategy succeeded with the Russian Revolution at precisely the same moment that Germany's leaders undermined it by a completely unnecessary policy, and a counterproductive one, which brought in the United States. And the result of that was that the First World War actually ended as a truce, uh, because a war which was above all between the Germans and the Russians ended up with the defeat of both. A peace settlement which was created against both and which could never survive, with all the likelihood, therefore, that the First World War would be part one of a bigger European conflict, which indeed it was. And the tragedy in terms of the book that I just last wrote was that this meant that two million Russians died in the First World War for nothing, and the whole thing had to be refought 20 years later. And that, I think, again, and this comes back to where I started, is an important element in the whole history of the Russian Revolution. I did get very fed up when I was teaching with endless undergraduate essays based on the conception that if only they'd made peace in 1917, all would be well. I can understand what they were arguing. But if you look at Russia in a box, in isolation from the international context, you leave out an awful lot of what is most important about the story and you fundamentally misconstrue what were the issues involved, in my opinion. Thank you. Thanks so much.